Well, a few weeks ago, I went to see my friend Andy. And I know that some of you have seen Andy's videos because he's the guy who has some of the American cars and also has a YouTube channel where he does some restoration on cars and other vintage equipment. Now Andy remembered that a few years ago on my channel I did actually restore a vintage Clark battery charger and what Andy's asked me to do, he said, can I do the electrical restoration of it because he wants to do the mechanical restoration of it and I have to say I'm more than pleased to do this because I do very much enjoy working on vintage electrical equipment. Now so far I've not been able to find very much information about this Krypton Charge Master online so maybe if you've got a little bit of time to do some searching if you do find any information please leave a link in the comments. But as we can see it is manufactured by the Krypton Company which is actually quite an old company in the UK. I think they actually started making electrical equipment in around the 1890s so they certainly have been going for quite a long time but I remember them being quite a famous company for making making stuff like battery chargers but they also did a lot of equipment for doing engine analysis and automotive testing and repair. So we can see we've got a label at the bottom here and it does actually say it's a safety fast charger and engine starter. Now I'm not really sure what the safety part is about. I'm guessing the fast part just means that it can deliver quite a lot of current and also because it says engine starter. So in theory this will actually deliver enough current to uh, boost the battery and start the engine on your car if you've got a flat battery. So I'm guessing that there's going to be a very substantial transformer in here and I think that's borne out because I can barely pick this thing up. It is really very heavy. So it feels like we've got some kind of a circuit breaker at the top here. I don't know if this is a thermal or a magnetic circuit breaker. I'm not sure but it has that feel about it. And I can see that the top of it here says auto, auto switching start. So again, I'm not really sure what the auto switching is. And again, unfortunately the actual labelling here is actually just all flaked off. So I'm not sure what the bottom setting is here. So is this just an on and off switch? Or does this maybe select between one mode and another? And I can see that we've got a warning label on the side. Let's take a closer look at that. Unfortunately, this label is also flaking away, so I can't read some of the writing, but it says something like isolate something or other before removing this panel and adjust tapping lead inside to suit the mains voltage. Now we've got some fairly hefty crocodile clips here, which of course are designed to clip onto our battery terminals. Interesting to know that these battery clips, they're not actually insulated, they're actually, uh, yeah, I can see that the actual wire here is connected to the body of the clip, and the clip itself is all manufactured from metal. So the actual uh, ground connection, the zero volts connection, that's no problem, but I'm guessing you're going to have to be quite careful here with the, uh, the plus 12 volt connection, because, uh, yeah, if this was to short out on the bodywork, of the car you could be in a little bit of a, a world of uh, pain and fire <laughs> yeah so uh, yeah electrical safety was always somewhat interesting back in the day now i'm guessing that this device was probably manufactured in the 50s or 60s i'm not exactly sure if you know leave it in the comments you can also see that we've got some very substantial here copper jaws on here so i'm guessing that the jaws on this that they're polished up these will look excellent but the actual cable itself of course it's unsurprising that it's actually in pretty poor condition. The actual rubber material has broken down and is just flaking off. It's gone very hard. Although I've got to admit some of the rubber seems okay so it might be possible just to cut this cable back. We'll have to investigate further. And of course this battery charger is designed to plug into the main so we've got a rather thick rubber mains cable and again the rubber cable itself is uh, really suffered and uh, we're going to have to replace this cable because it's in pretty poor condition. It's also got a plug on it for those plug aficionados. I think that this plug is made by, it looks like the Marbo company and it does say that it's made in England and it's also got a BS 1363 slash a stamp on it. Interesting enough the plug is old enough so it doesn't actually have the shrouded live and neutral terminals on it so in theory we should replace this plug and I'm sure that we will when we replace the mains lead. So of course not unsurprisingly after 60 or 70 years the rubber has really badly degraded because I can just see here we can see that the actual inner cores with the old wire colours which were back in the day they were red and black 
for uh, the live and neutral and also just a green wire here for uh, an earth cable now these are all just fully exposed in fact even the inner cores you can actually see the actual copper material from them also on the back of the battery charger we've got this receptacle and uh, inside that we've got this I'm just going to describe it as a probe now again there's nothing actually printed on here so we're not exactly sure what the purpose of this probe is we were actually making some guesses myself and Andy and uh, my friend Andy thought it was something to do with a battery rejuvenation function again I'm not exactly sure what I was wondering is because on the front of the unit it says thermostatic I'm wondering if this is some form of um, temperature probe maybe just a simple on off control because if you were to overcharge a battery the actual electrolyte the, uh, the acid inside can get absolutely red hot and you can boil it off now of course that's bad you don't want to overcharge a battery so I did wonder is it possible that this probe here you would actually screw the top off the battery where you fill it up with um, acid and water and I'm wondering if this actual probe here just sits inside the battery into the uh, electrolyte solution and maybe it monitors the temperature of the battery and switches the charger off if it gets too hot but I'm completely guessing so again if you know what that does it's certainly interesting leave it in the comments Looking at the top of our battery charger, I can immediately see that the actual amp meter on here has actually been replaced by a unit which is much more modern. I did find some pictures online and uh, this did have quite a colourful display and the original meter I think had a black bezel around it. So you can see that maybe the original meter was a lot bigger and somebody's actually just filled where the original meter would have gone with this piece of black plastic. It might actually be nice to see if we can actually replace this meter or maybe make a meter surround maybe 3d print one that will go over here to actually give it that vintage appearance now looking at the current reading on it it appears to go from two to about eight amps again i wouldn't thought that that's correct for here i would have thought that just given the weight of this charger i would have thought that this could probably do much more than that maybe 20 or 20 to 100 amps something of that nature so I'm guessing that this battery scale this ammeter scale isn't correct so we'll have to take a look at that we've got some other controls on the top of here now unfortunately there's nothing left of the original label I think that this was a piece of aluminium and we can just see that all the aluminium has gone very white and flaky and all the lettering that may have been on here and in fact all the original paint as well you can probably see that it's all just fallen off so unfortunately we don't know what these switches would do but again battery chargers are relatively simple so we've got a selector switch here so I'm guessing that what this selector would have done is it allows us to select from different tappings on the transformer usually the tappings are on the primary of the transformer and what you can do is you can actually alter very slightly the output voltage because the current which is drawn by the battery is pretty proportional to it depends how flat the battery is but it depends on the terminal voltage so by adjusting this selector switch here you can actually adjust the voltage on the clips by selecting a different tapping on the transformer now we've got another switch here which is a little bit strange because it's it's a momentary switch so I don't know maybe that could be the the boost start function again not exactly sure now before I start working on the charger I think I'd better lift it onto my bench here because I don't really want to be working on my hands and knees but I've got to admit I'm a little bit concerned that I might do myself a mischief because this thing is probably about at the limit of what I can lift ah, I wouldn't like to do that again now I'm not exactly sure how it comes apart but looking at it we've got some screws on the side here and uh, well that one certainly feels loose in fact this whole panel is loose so hopefully that's not going to put up too much of a struggle now the main thing that we have to worry about when we're working on a battery charger is the condition of the transformer because unfortunately if the original transformer has actually burnt out in here there's actually very little we can do now of course we could actually have the transformer rewound but just given the size of the transformer that we've got in here I don't really think that would be economical the unit itself actually only cost on eBay about £25 and I'm guessing we don't really want to invest too much money on it because you do find these on eBay fairly frequently 
So it looks like our battery charger is a game of two halves in that we've got a rather large selenium rectifier at the top of the unit. Now I'm guessing this is a selenium rectifier given the age of the unit and also given the, uh, the big heat sink fins on here because the forward drop across a selenium rectifier is relatively high so they needed some cooling. Looks like these very thick green wires that you can see here. I think these are the secondary coming from the transformer. I can also see what I described as being a circuit breaker previously. That's this quite large unit. It's actually much larger than I expected it to be. So again, I'm going to have to check that out. And I think if I was to reach inside the unit right at the back, I can see a terminal strip there, but I'm not exactly sure what's going on. Let's take a look at the bottom half of the unit where we've got our transformer. And as we suspected, you can see that we've actually got a very substantial mains transformer, a very heavy iron transformer in the bottom of the unit. It's got, um, looks like we've got three terminals on the secondary. So I'm guessing that this is a, this is a centre tap to fare. And then these two green wires go up to the rectifier. So yeah, so it looks like we've probably got a, Hmm, I was going to say that's going to be a, that's going to be a full wave rectifier in that configuration, isn't it? So, so I've just transferred to the shaky cam, hoping you can see that just above the transformer, you can see we've got an electric motor there, and mounted to that electric motor is quite a substantial fan unit. So I'm guessing that this unit is designed to be fan cooled. That's not something I've seen before on a battery charger. So. Yeah, that's quite interesting, isn't it? So another part that we're going to have to check out, make sure that we can get this fan working. But the transformer itself, just having a look at it visually, can't see that it's burnt, can't see that it's rotten. Um, looks as though it's actually wrapped in some kind of linen material that's maybe been dipped in varnish. But yeah, visual inspection looks okay. I'm not seeing anything to worry about. Returning to our selenium rectifier here, I always do consider these to be very dubious when they're actually installed in things like valve radios, mainly because they've got quite a lot of voltage across them and they are quite heavily stressed. Now, this unit itself, it's only going to have I don't know, maybe 12 volts across it, just a little bit more than that. So it's not going to be um, electrically stressed in the same way. But unlike a valve radio, potentially it's going to have, you know, currents, maybe even the hundreds of amps flowing across it. So I'm not sure whether or not, do we go ahead and replace this with a silicon equivalent? Or do we give the uh, old selenium rectifier uh, a chance? I'm not sure. Again, leave it in the comments. Let me know what you think. So having removed this other side panel, we can immediately see some electrical loveliness going on. And my eye is immediately drawn to this very thick piece of copper wire, which has been wound into a coil. And looking at the top here, I can see some switch contacts. Now I've never actually seen this before, but it looks as though this very heavy piece of copper wire here, it's forming a solenoid. So it's taking the current, I think it's the output current from our selenium rectifier. It goes through this very thick copper wire here. And then we can see that, maybe you can see it there, this other lead here goes onto a very substantial block of brass, which is actually connected, I think, to one's, the bottom side of this coil, if I'm reading it correctly. So I think that this is some kind of overcurrent trip. I'm not exactly sure which way it operates. I would guess that as it draws more current, it actually it closes that contact, but I'm not exactly sure. Um, and I'm sure that maybe that turns something off. And then on the outside of the cover, we saw that it was mentioning different voltage selections here. So I can actually see that we have got some voltage tappings here. So we've got a neutral connection, which is, well, that's zero volts. Then it goes 200, 210, 220, 230, and finally 240. So it looks as though maybe you have to adjust this wire here, depending on what voltage you've got. So I wonder what that's set to at the moment. I think that that's set to 230 volts, isn't it? But we could maybe set it to 240 or 230. I'm not exactly sure what the voltage is where Andy lives. For me, it would probably be 240 because my electrical supply is actually closer to 250. But then again, Andy's house could be different. He might have a lower electrical supply and he might want us to set it to a lower voltage. Now, as we suspected earlier, you can see that the primary side of the transformer here has got a huge amount of uh, different tappings on it. And of course, that's because it's easier to do the voltage selection on the primary side because the current in the primary side of the transformers 
just going to be a few amps whereas on the secondary side it's going to be 12 volts but it could be a few hundred amps it's difficult to make switch contacts that are going to work reliably a few hundred amps so of course they're going to do all the switching here on the primary side and again looking at the primary of the transformer just visually inspecting it I can't see that anything's been on fire it doesn't smell of burn the wiring is very dirty but apart from that it doesn't look too bad So taking a look inside the unit we can see the underside of the ammeter and you'll notice that there's actually only some very thin wires going to that ammeter. Well of course we can't actually put hundreds of amps through this particular ammeter so this is what they call an indirectly reading meter. So what it's got, it's got a current shunt somewhere so the majority of the current isn't actually going through the meter it's going to be going through what they call a current shunt. Now I had a little bit of trouble finding this current shunt it wasn't immediately obvious but I think I've spotted it. Now what I think we've got here we can't actually see it there's a piece of flat metal that goes between this side and this side and that's what they call a current shunt so the majority of the current is going to be flowing across here whereas just a little bit of current is going to be flowing through there's a couple of wires here and I suspect these are the wires that are going to the uh, to the current meter let me see if I can turn it round well sorry pretty much impossible to get the camera in but you can maybe just about see right at the far back of the picture here at the lower half of the frame you can maybe see there's actually a flat strip of metal and that metal has got some little cuts into it so what they actually do is they cut the strip of metal to alter its resistance and that alters the actual tiny amount of current which is going to our meter on the front so that's how the shunt is calibrated by cutting notches into it well having read some of the comments on a preview video that I put up I'm fairly sure that this is some kind of temperature probe or thermostat the idea being that this sits into the top of the battery and it measures the temperature of the electrolyte and if it looks like it's going to get too hot maybe starts boiling it's going to switch off the battery charger and it does look like our little thermostat probe does just push in in some form of little connector here now the cable itself this particular rubber cable it doesn't really seem totally awful what I'm going to do is I'm going to inspect it but I can see that it has gone bad at the end here where uh, where it goes, goes through this little cable clamp so yeah we're going to have to remake off that cable what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to check the other mains cable and uh, maybe we can look at testing the transformer okay so just looking inside the plug we have got a 13 amp fuse but looking at the wiring well that, I'm glad we didn't plug that in because as you can see all the insulation has actually come off the wires and uh, it actually looks as though it might have actually been a little bit melty in here so so I've cut away most of the rotten mains lead and I've just put a temporary plug on here for testing because I do intend to replace this mains cable with a brand new cable now this plug that I put on here it's just one of those hard plastic plugs and again for portable equipment really you want to put a rubberized plug on it for something that's going to go in the workshop because this gets dropped on a concrete floor and it can very easily smash and they're really the same for the cable when you're actually replacing the cable you really want to put a rubber cable on something which is designed for trailing cable applications so again rather than using a PVC cable we will replace it with a, a tough rubber trailing cable and uh, I've also replaced the 13 amp fuse with a 5 amp fuse just for testing purposes because not exactly sure how much current this thing's going to draw we'll measure that later so I think the first test that I'm going to do is earth continuity because I want to make sure that we've got a very low resistance path between the earth pin on my plug here and the earth point on the chassis of the equipment which is here this is where the earth wire comes out of the flex and it bolts to the chassis of the charger okay so we're getting one ohm there and let's see if we can find a point on the transformer itself again one ohm and let's see if we can find a nut or a bolt on the back of the cabinet here and again 0.1 of an ohm so we're pretty sure we've got a good earth connection so now I'm just going to measure the resistance between the live and neutral pins and it's actually coming up there 3 ohms that actually to me seems a little bit low for a mains transformer but this is quite a large power transformer but yeah I definitely think that's on the low side I wonder if that's going to change as we adjust these primary tappings Oh, 
Okay, goes up to 54 ohms at one point. Does the main circuit breaker on the front have any effect? Yeah, does seem to. Not sure what to make of that reading. To me that looks a little bit on the low side. So I think what we will do is we're going to run this up gradually. Maybe run it up with a lamp limiter and uh, just check the uh, current as we do that. And while we've got this meter out, I think we might as well go ahead and just do a quick insulation test for the primary of our transformer. So I'm just going to do that at the moment. We're actually going to do that test at uh, 250 volts and you can see that we've got about 19 mega ohms so that seems pretty good. And again about 19 mega ohms. I think I would also like to make a quick check of this selenium rectifier just to make sure there's no gross short circuits on here before we power it up. Now it is actually a little bit tricky to actually test these selenium rectifiers for a couple of reasons. One of them is because two of the diode sections at the moment they're going to be shunted by this secondary of the uh, transformer here and this secondary has got very thick wires on it so it will be a very low resistance that will make it more difficult to measure so really we need to disconnect these but the other thing is you can't very easily just measure the forward voltage on these rectifiers each of these uh, selenium rectifiers it isn't actually a single diode because selenium rectifiers have very poor reverse voltages so what they have to do is actually have to stack a number of rectifier diodes together to get the required reverse voltage. Now typically each one of these rectifier segments it tends to be about 1.2 volts and uh, well that basically means the forward voltage will be a few volts and it's more than you can measure with a, a traditional voltmeter on the diode range. So about the best you can probably do as a quick test is just to measure the resistance and uh, again just make sure that the reg rectifier segments aren't dead short. I don't generally like messing around with these secondary transformer windings because it's actually very very easy to actually break them off the transformer. I suppose the other advantage though of just disconnecting the rectifier it means that we can now safely just do an insulation re resistance check between the primary and the secondary of the transformer. Again make sure we haven't got any problems on the secondary side because we have tested the primary. In fact let's go ahead and do that first. About 32 mega ohms between the one side of the secondary and the actual chassis of the equipment. Let's just see if we can go from the secondary now to the primary. Okay we've got a secondary primary resistance there of 57, 58 mega ohms. So the transformer again no short circuits that looks okay. And just for giggles I wonder what the resistance is of the secondary winding. I'm expecting it's going to be very low. Okay well this meter only goes to 1 ohm so yeah it's measuring less than an ohm across the secondary winding. I think while we're in here I'm just going to check that we don't have a short circuit between the rectifier diodes, any of the three terminals here and the actual chassis of the equipment. Okay that's pretty high, that's reading 14 meg ohms. The next one is reading about 11 meg ohms. And the far terminal here which is the output of our rectifier that's measuring 19 meg ohms. So we don't seem to have any short circuits. Let's see if we can just measure the resistance of the diodes themselves. Now unfortunately using this type of meter we can't measure the forward voltage because these selenium rectifiers they aren't a single diode. There's actually a series of diodes which are joined together. Each of the plates on here is usually a volt drop of about 1.2. As far as I know this meter will only do a forward voltage of about 2 volts. I think for our first test we're going to leave the secondary of the transformer. We're going to leave that disconnected like that. So the rectifier is out of circuit but when we run this transformer up we should be able to measure the uh, secondary voltage here. Remembering that this is actually a centre tap transformer. So these are each side of the centre tap with the actual middle of the centre tap that's connected to the, uh, the zero volt lead, the black lead that comes out of the charger here.
I think for the first test we'll wake up this battery charger gradually because I'm going to increase the main supply using this Variac transformer. We've also got a lamp limiter in circuit. Now these lamp limiters probably won't work particularly well for this kind of thing because it draws too much current. I've put the biggest bulb in here which I've got which is about 200 watts but you'd probably want to use a, a bigger bulb. But let's try it. Let's switch on. Got the voltage set to zero. Let's just wind the voltage up. Oh, I can hear something. Well, I think that's a fan running. Let's take a closer look. Okay, well we've definitely got some fan action there, haven't we? But uh, yeah, it's making a dreadful wailing noise. I'm guessing the bearings are very dry. Let's just see if I can squirt some oil into that and quiet it down. Unfortunately, we haven't got a spray can that will reach into there, so I'm just going to try pumping a bit of oil into it. Okay, well the oil does seem to have worked its way in, so that seems to have done the trick. Seems to be running quite quietly now. I think we'll just switch off. I'm just going to attach a, a voltmeter to the secondary of our transformer here. Let's see if we're actually getting any voltage out of it. So I think the selector switch is actually in the off position at the moment because we're not getting any voltage out of the secondary. But obviously the fan is still in circuit. Okay, that's now glowing very, very faintly. And we're at 14 volts. 15 volts. 16. 17. 17 17.9 18.8 19.9 20.2 20.5 20.5 again and now we're back at the off position Now the fact that our lamp limiter was glowing so brightly there, I don't think it necessarily indicates a fault. I just suspect that this is quite a large transformer and it's probably got quite a high magnetising current. So I think what I'm going to do now is I'm going to just tackle it in a different way. So I'm going to use our clamp meter here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to disconnect the lamp limiter from circuit and I'm going to turn the voltage up with it set to the highest power output on the charger. And we're just going to monitor it on this clamp meter and just see what the, uh, the primary current is. And hopefully that isn't going to be too ridiculously high. Okay, so we're about 100 volts now. And we're drawing about 0.2 of an amp. So that's fine. I don't think that's going to be a problem. So let's keep going. 150 volts. Okay, we're drawing just under an amp. 0.7 an amp. Okay, 200 volts and we're drawing about 1.8 amps. Let me just go up a little bit more. Well, unfortunately, 2 amps is the maximum that my Variac will go up to. So I'm going to turn that back down and I think we're just going to try plugging it in off the main supply. I'm fairly sure there's no growth short circuit there. I'm fairly sure that this will probably top out at, I don't know, 2.5 amps, 3 amps. So let's try that. So I've disconnected our variable transformer. Let's have a go at running the battery charger directly off the mains. And my mains voltage here is around 240 volts. Let's switch on. So for a 240 volt input, we're getting 31 volts output across the secondary winding. And it looks like the input current is about, that's about 2.6 amps, isn't it? Taking a look at the front panel here, you can probably see that any lettering has long ago faded and corroded away. So unfortunately, we can't really tell where any of these selector switch positions are. So what I've done is I've quickly just gone ahead and just put some marks on here, mainly for safety so we know when it's actually switched off. Now we can see the unit is actually switched off at the moment and we're not getting any output voltage from the secondary of the transformer but we can hear that the fan is still running so even in the off position the fan still runs and I'm guessing that's to keep the selenium rectifier cool or to cool it down once you've been using it but let's just quickly go through these switch selection settings now we've got the voltmeter here we've got it set across the center tap 
and just one of the secondary windings or one end of the secondary winding. So let's go through that quickly. So off at the moment, 8 volts, 8.5 volts, 9.1 volt, 9.8, 10 volts, 11 volts, 12 volts, 13.5 volts, 14 volts, 15.9 volts, and I think our top setting is number 11, which is 17.5 volts, and then back to off. I think that the time has come now for us to reconnect our selenium rectifier and actually give this thing a try. Let's hope we can actually get some DC voltage out of it, fingers crossed. And I think the easiest thing to use for our first test is just a simple 12 volt lamp. I think this is something like a brake light bulb, so I'm guessing it's probably 21 watts or something. So it's going to draw an amp or so, maybe an amp and a half. So that should be good to give us an indication to see if this thing is actually doing anything. Well, I'm going to go ahead and switch on now. Oh, well, have we got a bad connection? Don't seem to have any voltage coming out here. So I've just taken our negative battery clip here because this is connected to the centre tap of the transformer. So let's just connect that onto there. Let's just check we've got some voltage coming out of the transformer. So yeah, we've actually got voltage coming out of both sides of our secondary. But for some reason we don't appear to have anything coming out of our rectifier. Let's just turn the unit round so we can test it. So I'm just going on the output from the rectifier, you can actually see we're getting some lamp glowage now, so yeah that's a good sign. I thought our selenium rectifier had gone open circuit because that is a really typical failure mode for these, but well, we are getting something out of the rectifier. That's going into one side of the current shunt for our meter, that's the output from the current shunt. Well, I think we may have something as unexciting as a bad connection. So let's just take this off and give everything a little bit of a clean and have another go. And I'm just going to give the back of our current shunt a bit of a wipe over with some abrasive paper as well. Well, we still appear to have nothing. We've got power into our clip lead. So maybe we've got a problem within the clip lead itself and it wouldn't surprise me because as you can probably see everything is really dirty and corroded. So let's see if we can take this off and take a look inside. Now I would have thought my chances of finger loss at this point are really quite high. Yeah I can see that this bolt here is very badly corroded. So it appears that our very thick cable here is actually soldered into this big brass boss which has got the battery clip on the end of it. Yeah I'm fairly sure that's soldered in. And uh, from what I can tell it looks okay. I'm going to give that a bit of a clean and then we'll just check the resistance of the lead itself. Well I'm going to finish off cleaning this clip up and I'll bring you back when I've done that. Well I'm afraid it did take me a little bit of time just to chase down multiple bad connections. But I think we've got there now and as you can see we're actually getting a DC output from our rectifier. We're at about 11.3 volts at the moment. So that's looking good. I think the next thing to do is let's try and put some load on this battery charger and see how much current we can pull from it. Now there's various ways we could do that. We could probably wire up a, quite a lot of 12 volt bulbs. I could maybe get my DC dummy load out of the lab, but I thought we could have a go at doing it more redneck style. So what I've done is I've gone ahead and I've bought one of these 12 volt automotive heaters. Now these things are absolutely terrible and get the most awful reviews. In fact it's quite likely it's going to just explode or hopefully just set on fire. Let's find out. Now apparently it claims that these little things output as much as 300 watts so if they do actually output 300 watts I think that should be around 15 amps at 12 volts. Can't see it myself. So I've got our voltage selector switch at the moment set to position 10 
and as you can see we're outputting 13.2 volts with a load of 11 amps now the top setting that I can do is number 11 so let me just turn that up So it looks like the maximum voltage we can get out of the charger at the moment is 14.6 volts and again we're at 11.1 amps. So of course the real test is will it actually charge a real battery? So I've actually got our clip leads connected to the battery of my 1953 Chevy and what we're going to do is just going to turn the power up and uh, see what it does. Well I'm on setting 6 now and I can see that my battery voltage has started to rise because we're now at 13.3 volts. Let's have a look at the current. The current draw is 4.8 amps. I think we can charge it a little bit harder than that. So I've just increased down to setting 6. I can see that the terminal voltage across the battery is about 14 volts and our charger is outputting about 6.7 amps. But as I watch it, I can see that the current is starting to fall relatively quickly as our battery charges. Now just to test our battery charger a little bit harder, I've gone ahead and I've switched all the headlights on the truck. And the terminal voltage of the battery is about 13.7 volts. You can actually see we're now supplying 22 amps. So I think this battery charger is working fine. So I had the battery charger supplying 20 amps for about half an hour and I'm glad to report that this selenium rectifier here it's actually absolutely stone cold, it's not even slightly warm. So it appears that our battery charger here does have bags of capacitor. We'll finish today's video where we started by taking a look at this label here which says safety fast charger engine starter but the bit that I'm interested in what actually gives us the safety. So the 12 volt output and the heavy current which is used to charge our battery it actually passes through this coil of very very thick copper wire and in the middle of this piece of copper wire there's actually a plunger and that plunger can move up and down. Now as the current increases that's flowing through this piece of copper wire the plunger is actually pulled up and it's pulled up to a point where it actually closes a pair of switch contacts here. So let me just do that. Hopefully you can see that I'm just pushing the plunger up and these switch contacts are opening or closing. Now when we're charging a battery normally and the current is in the normal range, this solenoid will actually sit at the bottom. But if you were to do something like short the leads together on the battery charger, you get an awful lot of current flowing through this coil and the magnetic field would get very high. And it would be high enough, the magnetic field would be strong enough to actually pull the plunger up and actually make this switch contact activate. So I trace the wiring back from the contacts of our overload switch and it appears to go to the switch on the front panel of the unit here. And what I think happens is I suspect that this switch is probably operated by an internal solenoid. So what happens is our overcurrent switch, it actually sends a signal to this if it draws too much current. And I'm guessing what will happen is it, it will automatically switch off like that. So I just want to test that idea. Let's hope it doesn't explode. Now I don't want to short circuit the output from my battery charger because I don't want to risk damaging the rectifier. So what we're going to do is we're just going to simulate an overcurrent. The way we're going to do that is we're going to make these switch contacts close here because we're going to lift up the plunger which runs through the solenoid and hopefully it should switch off the main switch. So let me try that. Okay, well you see it did just switch off. So let's just try that again. And finally. So I've traced back the wiring from our probe here and it appears to be wired in parallel across the overcurrent switch contacts. So I think what we've probably got here, we've got a bimetallic switch inside here. The idea of this is you actually insert it into the top of the battery and if the electrolyte starts to boil because you're overcharging the battery, I think what it should do is I think it should make the charger switch off in the same way that it did when we had an overcurrent. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take it, I'm going to put it into a cup here and I'm going to put some hot water into the cup. I'm going to see if it works, who knows. So I've got a flask full of boiling water here. I'm going to fill my cup up. And let's just go ahead and dump in our probe. I'm 
Well, I've got to admit my probe does feel pretty hot, but yeah, it's not turned off, has it? So I'm fairly sure that the only thing that we're going to have inside of our probe here is just a very simple bimetallic switch. And when the actual end of the probe here gets hot, the switch will close and it should turn off the unit. Well, that's not happening. Now, I've just noticed that the cable itself, it's not in very good condition. So it could actually be open circuit, this cable. But also just looking at it, it does actually plug into the back of the unit here. And it is just a two core cable. So I think in theory, we should actually just be able to short out this connector here and uh, just simulate this probe. So let's try that. Okay, well that works. So it looks like the trip mechanism itself appears to be in good order. So that leads me to believe that there must be something wrong with this probe or maybe the connecting wire between the probe and the actual battery charger. I'm not sure. Now I can see at the back of the unit we've got what I think is a screwed collar and I assume that's maybe just a cord grip. Can I undo that? Okay, yeah that came off fairly easily. And there's what also appears to be what I think is another screwed collar. Does that come apart? We've only got two wires going into the body of the probe and it looks as though you can see there's a copper coloured strip at the bottom. I think that's one side of the switch and I think this is the top side of the switch here. And I can see that there's also a little grub screw here with a very fine nut and bolt assembly on it. So I think that this is maybe to actually adjust the operating point of the switch. Now I'm guessing if there must be a rod or something like that, that which actually moves up and down inside the end of the probe, maybe, the, maybe it expands. And I think when that gets hot this switch should close. But I don't see any sign of that happening. But one thing we can do is we can just turn the unit back on and just to check the cable I can put a short circuit between here and here and that's going to simulate that switch contact closing. So let me do that. So I'm going to short out those switch contacts now. Okay, and the output has actually turned off, so it looks like the problem must be in the probe itself rather than the wiring. We must have a problem with the bimetallic switch. I'm hoping when I take this nut off I can just remove this bottom switch contact because I think there's going to be a rod which pushes against the underside of it. That's what I'm going to guess anyway. Oh yeah, I can see there is a little rod there. I've mounted the thermostat in the vise and I've actually got a dial test indicator just pressing on the top of the plunger which I think is driven by some kind of bimetallic element with inside here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a heat gun now, I'm going to heat up the probe tip and hopefully we should actually get the, uh, the plunger to extend and it should make the DTI gauge go round. Okay, well it did move, but I think I had to put an awful lot of heat into that. We notice as it's cooling down, the plunger is retracting, so it looks as though the bimetallic element is working to some extent. Well, I've spent quite a while trying to get our probe working. I've tried to get some lubrication into it. Also, just trying to give it a bit of a tap to see if maybe there was something sticking inside this tube. But it doesn't seem to want to free up. And although you can actually heat this rod up quite strongly, it doesn't seem to translate into enough movement to actually operate the switch. Now, unfortunately, looking at this, it is all potted in plastic, so I'm fairly sure that this really isn't serviceable. So what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to put this back together because it is nice to keep it just for the history of the unit. We've given this old battery charger quite a good going over and we have proved that it can actually operate safely with the exception of the temperature probe which is a little bit of a shame but I don't think we're going to be able to fix that. I think next time what we're going to do is we're going to have a look at this ammeter because it's not original and it also doesn't work so we're going to have to see if we can find another ammeter that's going to match our current shunt which is installed in the unit but I think for today that'll do so until next time bye bye for now.